Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, sharing this wonderful afternoon with all of us. Uh, just a couple of uh, administrative announcements. If you're going to testify written or verbal, uh, make sure you sign in. And if you're going to send uh, your written testimony, please send it to my address at Bridge Point Building, uh, Suite 202, 140 Aspinall Avenue in Ganya. And if you wish to send it to my email, you can send it to Senator Pedro at senatorjpterlai.com. Thank you very much. So those that are uh, 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 going to testify, you can come up front and uh, we can start. Before we commence our uh, hearing today, I want to kind of recognize a couple of our, my colleagues here. To my left, to my left, uh, Sabrina, Senator Sabrina Perez, and our Committee on Rules, uh, Senator Bisco Lee, and to my immediate left, uh, Senator Jim Moylan. To my right, ladies and gentlemen, is Senator Kelly Morris, and Senator Telu Taitagui, and I guess uh, Senator Sabina, uh, Where's uh, okay, she's on the phone. So we're going to go ahead and commence. Senator Nelson to my immediate right, but she's on the phone. We're going to go ahead and start from the left with Jackie and then we go to the right, okay? Go ahead, go ahead, Jackie. Buenas and half a day, honorable senators. Uh, my name is Jackie Ariola Marati, and I appear before you in my capacity as a private citizen. Uh, before I provide some, and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on Bill 101-35, which are the rules and regulations as constituted um, by the Guam legislature. Can you just give me a moment to uh, uh, finalize all the things that that I need to say before we start the uh, the testimony because that's part of the procedure oh, because thank you. this is being recorded. Havare, Hamju Torus, Sizus Masi, Nifinatun Mizu. This public hearing by the Committee on Public Safety, Border Safety, Military and Veterans Affairs, Marriage Council, Infrastructure, Public Transit is hereby called to order. For the record and in accordance with Section 8107 of Chapter 8, Title 5, GCA, in the first public hearing notice, the first public hearing notice was sent out on Monday, April 22nd, 2019, for the five to meet the five working days requirement. Notice in the second public hearing, uh, notice was uh, in adherence to this uh, uh, to, to the policies. Uh, to the 48 hours notice was sent out on Friday. April 26, 2019, and in addition to that, this public hearing notice was sent out to the Guam Legislature uh, website. Bill 101-35 uh, or Act to authorize the rules and regulation for the Games of Chance at the Liberation Day Carnival Guam Island Fair was introduced by myself at the request of the Governor's Office the Mayor's Council of Guam, and my colleagues to allow the legislature to approve the rules and regulation pr promulgated for the Game of Chance in cooperation with the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Revenue and Taxation. We have previously had a hearing on these rules and input from my colleagues and the community and have led to the amendment uh, amended version uh, that you are viewing today. The time now is at 2.35. PM. <laughs> Go ahead, Jackie. Thank you, Senator uh, Terlahi. Again, um, my name is Jackie Ariola Marati, and I appear before you in my capacity as a private citizen. Um, before I provide some comments on the reconstituted uh, uh, rules and regulations, I would like to ask the kind legislature, particularly as we are in Earth Month, and hopefully Earth Month should be every single month of the year, to be kindly considerate about um, the uh, printing of your 
bills that are provided to the public that is only one-sided. Um, I know a lot of companies and other organizations uh, are looking to be a little bit more mindful about um, what they do to our environment, and I would also ask the Guam legislature that you also take on that responsibility. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony uh, to improve Bill 101 for our citizens. Uh, I'd like to offer the following amendments. <clears throat> On page four, line nine, I would like to ask that the pre-bid conference be publicly noticed and that all successful bidders will be publicly announced. Number two, page six, line six. Please insert the word or the term non-refundable before your cleaning deposits. Number three, page seven, line nine. My question is, are only US incorporated firms qualified to offer bids on the casino? Is it only US-based firms or incorporated firms? If that could be clarified, we would like to know. Page eight, <clears throat> line seven. As earlier submitted, it was requested that officers that are conducting casino games also have police clearances and not to be on the sex offender registry. We ask that that be included in your rules, your final rules as you, you see them. Page 11, line 10. During the last conversation, it was identified that a nonprofit was to be the recipient of the funds and that would the, the nonprofit be have, have the operating account for the casino games. Can you please include the name of this nonprofit who holds the operating account, as well as a certification from the Department of Revenue and Taxation that the nonprofit is in good standing with all filings and payments current. Number six, page 13, line seven. Please assure that the OPA's report is publicly available. The first thing that I notice, if I can add one more, is that again, the definitions of games of chance was not included in the rules and regulations. It was indicated that those definitions, legal definitions, would be included in the RFP. I don't think that satisfies the need to protect our citizens in terms of what exactly these games are. I could call a game anything and if I have no legal definition, and I believe a legal definition should be included, it could be any form of gambling. And again, so that we protect our citizens and everyone knows exactly what's being legalized here and nothing is changed from what the original intent was, that those definitions be included in the final rules and regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. My name is Ken Leon Guerrero. I'm representing the Guam Citizens for Public Accountability. And I have some suggestions for amendments to be made to this. First of all, in the rules and regulations, there's no mention about alcohol being sold on the premises. If there is going to be alcohol sold on the premises, I think it should be included in here and that any vendors inside the games area must be required to use chips, no cash. I, I see vendors setting up alcohol and using a bar as a way to get cash into the casino so people could take cash out of the casino. I think we need to make sure that any food or beverage that is authorized inside the casino must use cash. Now, I've mentioned this several times. It hasn't been picked up yet, but I hope that you include it. It's funny how when you go to events down at ePAL, you have to go to the cash cage to buy script. And you use script at all the vendors inside 
the uh, EPAL. I'm recommending that uh, under uh, the section on the script that the sole seller of script will be Revan Tax. That way we have an audit trail. When people come and buy script, they're given a receipt. When people redeem script, they're, give, they're given a receipt. So it creates an audit trail. And at the same time, uh, Revenue Tax can issue 1099. So if I come in, if I buy a hundred dollars of script and I cash out with ten thousand dollars worth of script, they can issue me a 1099 for tax purposes. So that we make sure that the uh, taxes are paid. And then we have a daily transition because the vendors will have to buy the script to man their, uh, their uh, daily cash and they have to redeem script. So if a vendor starts the day out with a cash bank of $1,000 and at the end of the day he redeems $25,000 worth of script, we have an auditable taxable event. So we can make sure that we are getting the full business privilege tax and an accounting for the taxes to be paid by the vendors. Uh, having vendors selling script or other people selling script outside of revenue tax, um, it's, a, it's a cross purposes. The purpose of revenue tax is to make sure that appropriate taxes are collected and paid and accounting. The vendors, their goal is to make as much money as they can. So if I go to a vendor and give him $1,000, what's to stop him from reporting $250 in sale of chips? So you see, by taking the vendors, you're taking the temptation out of the equation. So if you're going to sell this package to the community as something that is focused on transparency and accountability, having all the cash go through one source, and that would be the uh, revenue tax cash cage. We make sure that all monies are accounted for, all taxes are collected, and all taxing events are recorded. And the same thing goes if there's an alcohol vendor in there, because now if somebody's selling alcohol in there, he's going to start. He's going to come to the revenue tax. He's going to give him a thousand dollars for his cash bank, and at the end of the day, he's going to come in and give three to four thousand dollars worth of chips. Again, transparency and accountability, audit trails, and make sure that proper taxes are collected. Now, on section four, business application and fees, number two, names and addresses of five individuals over the age of 18 who are primarily responsible for conduct of the games. What does that even mean? I think it should be clarified that anybody working inside the uh, house of cards or games of chance must have a police clearance turned in and on file, nobody working inside the cash, I mean the house of cards or the casino should be in there without having provided a police clearance. Limiting it to five, what is the point of that? So that we got 35 people handling money and the person that's uh, sweeping the floor, the person that's taking out the trash are the only ones we've got names on. We need to have the transparency and accountability. These are the people that are working in here and they've all been cleared so that we're not putting uh, convicted felons or sex offenders or anybody else in there. Now the reason that's so important that we do these things is because there's a lot of people that have illicit businesses that generate a lot of cash that are looking for ways to wash the money and what better way to walk into a casino, take in $10,000 and walk out, you know, with clean money. So it's very important that we follow the guidelines that all of you ran on, transparency and accountability. Well, here's a way to make a transparent accountant, a single source of cash in, cash out. Um, and then on the section five, uh, I think that needs to be standardized at 21 because what are we going to do? Someone goes to the, the 
outside games? Are, they, are you going to give them a stamp or a ticket and then they can walk into the inside games? I'm not sure how that's going to work. How do we let somebody in to play red color but stop them from going into the house of cards? Are you going to be checking the IDs of everybody that walks into the house of cards or just into the gaming area? Are you going to have double the manpower requirements, having them double check? I think that needs to be standardized and since uh, and they you either standardize it at 18 and nobody sells alcohol in the casino area or you standardize it at 21 so that anybody that goes in will be able to buy alcohol if they so desire but again you need to put in here somewhere whether or not alcohol is going to be sold in there what the requirements are because the requirements to set up alcohol are a lot different and there's nothing in here that says any vent, anybody uh, dispensing alcohol in here has to follow the ABC rules. And again, uh, you know, we're talking about 562 cash control reporting sheets. I think by having everything go through the rev and tax, that all takes care of itself because the, the, oppor the opportunity to cheat in manual systems is astronomical. But when we have a third party receiving cash and tra uh, trans, trans, no, cashing up, turning cash into chips and chips into cash at a single point and have it uh, not only have two people in the cage all the time, but also have it monitored by video. I think that that's the best we can hope for, for this type of an event to be as transparent as possible. Um, now, the other thing is this whole thing was sold to the public and has been promoted as a way to raise funds to support the carnival and the carnival activities. And then we have here um, on section eight, determination of proceeds, 45% of anything left over going to the mayor's council and 45% going to the first gentleman's choice of a worthy cause with 10% going to revenue tax to offset their cost. Now this is where it gets a little confusing because it's almost like now the Mayor's Council of Guam has incentive to scrimp and save and cut back on the activities of the Liberation Day because they know that anything they don't spend on liberation is going to go into their slush fund. So we either have to, ha we have to, you know, the money is either spent on liberation or if, if it's collected in excess of operation, then whatever's left over needs to go to something like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, Guam Memorial Hospital uh, Medicine Fund instead of going to a slush fund because this way, the mayors will have no incentive whatsoever to cut back on the activities and efforts to make this the best liberation carnival ever because they know that anything they don't spend on the liberation carnival is going to go to a badly needed, um, going to support a badly needed uh, program and that is the Guam Memorial Pharmaceutical Fund and I'll tell you I, I, I from personal experience when my mother-in-law was dying they did not have the meds that they needed to give her so I had to go to mega drugs just down the street and buy the drugs myself because they did not have the specific pain pill that would not um, interact badly or what is the word, you know, you know, cause a bad reaction with the medicines they, they had her on for a heart attack. So the fact that Guam Memorial was so short on this particular medicine 
that they wrote me a prescription to take the mega drug down the street tells me that rather than putting any leftover funds from this event into a slush fund for the mayor and the first gentleman, and I'm still trying to wrap myself around this one, why are we taking this money and giving it to the first gentleman? At least it's not going to his checking account as it was in the previous bill. I think it should be specifically earmarked for the pharmaceutical fund at Guam Memorial Hospital because that is in bad need of money all the time. Uh, that concludes my suggestions for this. I would like to see those changes incorporated in in the spirit of this body's commitment to accountability and transparency, especially on an on an issue that has been as hotly debated in this community as gambling. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, let me just say that the recommendation uh, that uh, Jackie and you, Glenn, uh, will, uh, will be uh, really reviewed, and my committee will review that to include the legal counsel and if it merits that we need to uh, insert your recommendation, then we will. And probably, uh, because this is the second hearing on the rules and regulation, maybe we can put it as an attachment to the original law or original bill. Uh, go ahead, uh, Angel. Good afternoon. I'm Angel Sablan, the Executive Director of the Mayor's Council of Guam. First off, I'd just like to thank Jackie, Marathi, and Ken Young Guerrero for being here and offering um, their suggestions to make this bill or make the rules and regulations for the games of chance at the carnival um, something that can work for everyone. Um, their suggestions um, are worth noting and worth uh, contemplating on and um, if that's what it takes, I mean, we, we don't have a, any objections. We, we can bring up certain ideas where um, their suggestions may um, not work. But uh, let me just go over the, um, the rules and regs as we had it from the last hearing to this hearing and with Jackie's recommendations. On 1.1 where games will be defined, um, we still insist that it be defined in the bid packet simply because those bid packets are the ones you are going to bid on. You're not just bidding on rules and regs, you're bidding on a package that is spe specific as to what the game is. And we all know, like Ken here said, that there's probably 5,010 different games uh, of chance in a casino. We're only talking about these seven or eight and if we put it in rules and regs and in law, then next year if you change the name poker to something else, then you can't play it because it's poker. Uh, but if you put it in the, define it in the packet, and as long as it follows the rules and regulations, then that's what you're bidding on. On the 1.2 suggestion that she had about the vendors and the outside of the games of skill, putting up a sign as to what their prizes or the merchandise are worth. I've been to many carnivals and many uh, fairs and amusement parks and I never see any sign about how much is a toy worth or how much is a plush animal worth. I mean, we all know that if you pay two, three dollars, you're gonna get something that's less than two or three dollars or you're gonna get something that's more than two, three dollars if you're lucky. So I don't think it's necessary here because these are for the for the kitty games. I mean, the coin toss, the ring toss, the dart balloon, the duck pond, the spin the wheel. I mean, everybody can see what's there as far as merchandise is concerned. On 1.3, where she recommended we remove including but not limited to, uh, we're just following the verbiage in Public Law 35-4, word for word. On 2.5, about uh, what types of identification forms are going to be accepted. We've clarified that and we government issued identification. Passport, driver's license, uh, employment uh, ID cards. 
And as far as age requirement uh, to play, that's already listed in 5.1 and 5.81. And there is a difference. There's an 18-year-old and 21-year-old in these rules and regs. But we've, I think it was Senator Bisco Lee that said that the 35-4 specified 21 years of age, and there is nothing in that law that specified that. But we have decided to make the House of Cards only 21, as most casinos are. We've, we've looked at, every, at all the 50 states, almost every one of them is 21 years and above. Now, for the other games, like bingo and that, many states vary from 18 to 21. So we're, we put in the rules and regs that before you enter the House of Cards, you, you either have to an ID that shows you're 21 years old or you're not coming in and you're not playing. But if you're on the outside, where it's the color game or the biggest more, or the Beto Beto, 18-year-old. Um, I mean, you, if, the, if the operator wants to see your, your identification in your life, then you better produce it or you don't play. On 5.4, Operation times are made clear in these rules and regs, and specified. In 5.5 about the location of the games, the location will be specified and proclaimed in the government's proclamation when she, when she issues the authorization to do the games of chance at the Liberation Carnival or the Guam Island Fair. We added a new 5.73, which she has some concerns about um, electronic games. So we put that in there that there are no electronic games or devices authorized the deliberation games that are not allowable by Guam law. On section six, we changed timely manner to on a daily basis, which means every single day. And in 7.51, we changed uh, it from at the conclusion of the carnival to within 60 days of the conclusion of, of the carnival. Mr. Younger's suggestion about alcohol, there's gonna be no alcohol sold in the House of Cards. People can bring it in if they're 21 years old, but it won't be sold inside the House of Cards. Simply, we don't have the space. I mean, we're going from the Tizen big footprint to a smaller footprint at Paseo, and also there'll be no food sold inside the House of Cards. You can get it from the vendors outside, and, or the operator can order it and have it brought in. So there'll be no cash inside the House of Cards. It's just one cage, a cashier's cage with a revenue tax there, and everything is chips. Now, there are two vendors. That one vendor has his own chips, this vendor has their own chips. I mean, you can't take chips from Senator Terlahi's House of Cards and go to Senator Nelson's House of Cards and use the same chips. They're two, two different chips. <laughs> but you're welcome to come and see. But yes, um, there will be no chips. I mean, there will be no cash inside the House of Cards. As far as the outside of the carnival, you know, we've thought this over, and, it, and it's up to you. You can think it over. but. It, I, it won't work. It will not work. If you're going to make Tan Maria tell somebody to go and get your chips over there at the cashier's cage and come back and get your empanada, she'd rather not come and make empanada. Or if you're going to take a small kitty game, duck pond, and say, give me your chips first. I mean, kids, but I leave it up to you. I know what Mr. Younger is trying to do. But we're trying our best to, to be transparent, to be accountable, and that's why we've included revenue and tax to be a part of this liberation festivities, because they're the regulatory agency. We are not. And, and you know that the rules and regs says they're going to be present on the grounds, not just in the House of Cards, but on the grounds itself. So they can see for themselves. They can see if a vendor has 50 people a night and another vendor has only two, and they come in and report their sales and they say, oh, what, am I, what happened? The one with the 50 vendors only re lets, reports less than the one that had two, then something is wrong. And I'm sure that they'll be on, on top of it. Uh, 
we're in round three. We first had the hearing on Senator Moylan's bill to allow this, then we had the public hearing on the first set of rules, and now we're here on round three, on the second. And I just want to bring something up. It's, it's very ironic that here we are trying to make something work that can bring in some funds for our Liberation Carnival. And while we are trying to work to make it something that can be useful, can be accepted by the people of Guam, while we get the flack because we want to do this, every single night and every single day, the same things that these rules and regs would have controlled is not being controlled in House of Cards that are happening around the island. We're being blind and we're being deaf. If you think that not having the House of Cards at the Liberation Carnival is going to help anyone, yes, it will help those that are operating it right now. We've heard some from people that are interested in doing this. And they said, Mr. Sablon, are those house of cards that are operating now going to be stopped from operating for the 60 days? I said, I don't know. I'm not a regulatory agency. They're not being taxed. They're not being regulated. They're being left alone. And here we are trying to get something that we can tax and we can regulate only for 60 days so that we can get some money for the liberation festivities. And we're here so far out from the beginning of the, of the carnival. We have some vendors that have already said, well, they may have an interest a month ago, they have no interest now. Because they don't see how they're going to be able to put up a facility, order materials and things that had, order their chips and get it here in time to open for the June 5th. Um, beginning of the carnival. And whether or not we get the $250,000 minimum for what we're asking for the House of Cards, that gets lower and lower, I think, as the days go by, because we're probably not going to have those vendors. And where Mr. Lungaro says that uh, the Mayor's Council of Guam has a slush fund, we don't have a slush fund. Our MCOG accounts, non-appropriate funds are audited every single year by the Office of Public Accountability. There is no slush fund. We account for the money that's in there and we account for our income and we account for our expenditures. And we don't mind. If you, if, if you have another place this money is gonna go to, it's fine with us as long as it's a worthy cause. And his, Pharmaceuticals may be a worthy cause. But you know, it's the Mayor's Council of Guam that worked hard for it. So why don't you just put a provision there that will give it to the Mayor's Council of Guam, provided, however, that whatever funds they get will go to like the Guam Memorial Hospital, or to the schools, or to GPD, or to somewhere. So at least we know that what we raise and what we contribute back to the community came from what the mayors work for. And we've done that. We've done that without even being told in legislation to do that. As far as uh, Jackie's suggestion about how do we know what non-profit organization, if we list it here, then those are the only organizations you're gonna be able to give. Every single year, it's gonna be a different organization. But our suggestion to make sure that they are uh, organizing in good standing, paying their tax, that we can put in there. But as far as naming them, next year we're going to come back and amend the rules and regs and the law again because if we give it to another nonprofit, we're going to have to have it done by legislation again because this year we've already named somebody. So that's the only reason. But her suggestion of making sure that they're fully vetted by revenue tax, we have no problem with that. And the suggestion to vet also those operators, it's not gonna be a foreign corporation because the, the 
the rules and regs, as it's already put here, says that the only operators are going to be sponsored by nonprofit organizations. But those nonprofits better vet who their investors are. I agree. It shouldn't be somebody that has a criminal record or a sexual deviant or whatever. And if Ken wants all the members of the organization listed down, we don't have an objection to that either. We want to be transparent. We want to be accountable. We want to work with their organization to make sure that this thing works. Because we don't want to come back here and tell you, I'm sorry, we failed this year. We didn't do what we were supposed to do. Because we promise you, we, don't, we want to come back next year and make it even better. And say, hey, you know, it worked. It worked for our Liberation Carnival. It raised some money for us. Then we can have to say that, oh, it's making social leos for our community. Because that's what we don't want to do. This is only 60 days. We have things that are operating 365 days a year that fall under the same category. And yet nothing is being done about it. Like I said, I thank Jackie, I thank, thank Ken, I, I thank everybody that has put their input in here. But we're running against the clock. And if we don't do something to make a decision, then the 75th diamond celebration may become the 75th bronze celebration. Because we can't buy fireworks on consignment. We can't book entertainment, letting them know, well, we'll see how much we get before we decide how much to pay you. We need to know up front what we have in our hand to spend before we make a commitment. Our commitment to you is we do want to make the 75th Liberation Facilities a grand one for all of us. And to honor and memorialize our people, those especially that suffered during the war. And having these games to chance doesn't mean that we're dishonoring them. It only means we're trying to figure out a way to be able to bring in those funds without taxing it on the backs of our people to make the celebration happen. And I just hope Ken and Jackie would see it that way. We're, just, we're trying. We're trying to see what we can do. Their suggestions are good. If the senators want to, to put it in, let's make it happen. But let's also compromise. We've got to all work together. This is our island. What, what didn't work 10 years ago may work this year, may work now. I can't believe that we're just so in inept, so useless that we can't get something that works someplace else to work here. At least let us give it a chance. And if it doesn't work, then we can it. But you can't say that something that's happening already, unregulated, untaxed, cannot work well if it's regulated and if it's taxed. It's only going to benefit our people. Thank you. Senators, for your time. Thank you, Andrew. I just want to say that, uh, you know, with all this combination of the, the rules and regulation requirements and the suggestion by Jackie and Glenn and, you know, Angel, you know, all the things that we wanted to happen and some of the restrictions, you know, has been clearly enunciated on the rules and regulation to include the suggestion from Glenn and Jackie. So, uh, just, I just want to say that your recommendation is fully uh, accepted, and then we will look into that. Uh, before we, uh, we uh, co uh, continue, uh, I just want to uh, start from 
and have uh, my colleagues uh, ask questions or w make recommendations or whatnot. Uh, I want to start with uh, my favorite senator, Joseph St. Augustine. He said no. And um, uh, Senator Bisculi, Jim Moylan. We're all good? Okay, and then let me start from, uh, uh, from the right. Uh, Senator uh, Terlai, and then we'll work our way down to the left, to your right. Thank you very, very much, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Jackie, could you please clarify on your point number five? Um, wait. It says the, uh, the name of the mayor's nonprofit. So I'm looking on page 11, line 10, but did I miss that? Could you please thank you, Senator. Thank, thank you for asking for that clarification. Uh, during the discussion um, held during our last meeting, there was a back and forth that went on with regard to where the funds were going to be going, uh, all of the, 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 the gambling funds. And it was very clear from Revan Tax, I believe, that the monies were going to be going to the general account. So the issue was how do we know how much we're making if it's all going into one account? And so the question was raised, oh, it's not going to go into that. It's, in fact, going to go to a nonprofit. And the question was, who's nonprofit? And the answer was, the mayor's nonprofit. So that question is, if the mayors have a nonprofit, which nonprofit is that that all of the casino monies are going to be going into? And I think it should be in the rules and regs in terms of uh, identifying that as opposed to, say, misleading the public that the money is going to be going to the general fund. Mr. Sablon, can you clarify then where in here it says the money that you raise from the bids, where that money goes? Where is that money going to go? The money from the bids actually goes to the expenditures for the Liberation Carnival. But how is it held before it's spent? It's placed in the Guam Island Fair account. Guam Island Fair account? Is that a government account or a nonprofit? It's account under the Mayor's Council of Guam. Mayor's Council? Okay. It. We established it. Okay, so all the money from the bids will go into that account and then it will be used for the carnival expenses and then at the end it would be divided 45 percent, 45 Whatever, ten. after all the expenditures okay. are paid, whatever is left, yes. All right. How much There's do also you... the Queen's raffle, I mean Queen's uh, uh, committee that raises money through the raffle. Mm -hmm. That goes into the Mayor's Council of Guam revolving fund. Oh. And that money... Because that money is divided up among the Queen candidates, depending on the, how much money they, uh -huh. they... How many tickets they sell, they get a certain percentage back, as much as 50%, okay. going back to them. And of course, the raffle winners, the first, the grand prize is $10,000, so that comes out of, All right. of those accounts. And the balance? And the, the balance, balance, the balance in, is, in the saved, revolving it, fund. Is, is saved in a revolving fund for, just like what Ken said, give it to a worthy cause, or we save some for purchasing of raffle tickets for okay. next year. Okay. How much do you expect the carnival to cost? What, what, are, what would you be your Well, estimation? the cost has been as discussed through our liberation meetings on, on Tuesdays. Um, I'm not a member of the finance committee, but the finance committee has come up with a little bit over half a million dollars, inclusive of, you know, Fireworks, entertainment, security, uh, porta potties, uh, cleanup, things like that. Yes, utilities. All right. So you're hoping to raise that much at least, then the half a million? Or are they looking at other funding sources? I'm not just hoping. I'm praying. Okay. That we do. I mean, like I said, there's already some vendors that have decided that maybe maybe the time frame is just too short to be able for, to do something. But so. this is expected to be the main source of the half a million dollars? Yes. Okay. Yes. What, what, um, what, did you, this, um, these illegal house of cards, do you agree they are illegal, the ones that you say are going on right now? I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to say they are illegal, but they are operating. Have they been reported? I don't know, Senator. 
But you're aware of but, them? I mean, every mayor is aware of them operating. They've mentioned it here at public hearings. Okay. And so you said June 5th? I think it's under the form of social gambling. So mm -hmm. that's why it's very difficult okay. to stop. You mean at private homes? Yes. Okay. Um, and then you said, you said June 5, and I thought that the last time somebody said the end of May, but is that your estimated begin date now, June that 5? Is, that is the published start date, it's June 5th. Okay. Because remember, a week before that is the Guam Micronesian Island Fair. Okay. So, but the, but the carnival will not begin till June 5? June 5th, a Wednesday. To and last for 60 with, days? Is, yes. That's your understanding? I think it's August, if I'm correct, my math is correct, it's August 3rd or 4th, one of those days. Okay, yes. so the, the role of Reven Tax is just to collect the forms at the end of the night, meaning the, the GRT, how much in GRT they are owed? And not day? just the end of the night, but the beginning of the day as well. What do you mean? In the House of Cards. Why do you, what does because that mean? Because you have to know what you start with before you know what you end with. What are they reporting in the beginning well, of the day? Well, they're going to ensure that if you start out with $50,000 and you come at the end of the night that you only have forty, you lost 10000 Okay. But if you only come at the end of the night and you just reported forty, how do you know that you didn't start out with 100000 or how to start out with 20000 All right. Yeah. Well, the reason I'm asking is because when I'm reading the rules, it looks like Revenue Tax is only going to receive a form, kind of a passive involvement as opposed to monitoring no. the money or, or counting the money or anything like that. Uh, believe you me, I don't think they will be passive the way they were talking at the last hearing. Yes. All I right. mean, they've even put in their recommendations to charge penalties to the vendor or vendors if they do not comply with the requirements. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Mars. Sainamaasi, everybody, for being here and for continuing to provide your public testimony, your scrutiny over such issues so that uh, we are working to better protect the community. Um, and I just want to point out before I start that um, there is a difference between if there are House of Cards operating at this time uh, potentially they are operating without government sanction and so a major difference is what we're talking about here is the government sanctioning a house of cards so that definitely needs to be scrutinized in a way that uh, the community interests are best protected and um, that everything is as we've talked about transparent so to more fully protect our youth and the community at large I have made a few recommendations that I consider to be important changes to the games of chance, the rules and regulations for it. So uh, akin to what was offered in the public testimony, um, I was looking at the vendors. And so for section 2.1, I think it is imperative that all of the bidders right now, they just say that uh, the highest bidder will be awarded. But I think it is imperative that the bidders themselves be in good standing with the entire government of Guam. Um, every agency, every entity, uh, there's nothing reported against them. Other taxes are in order, those sort of things. So I have some revised language that I can be passing on to the chair, that they be both uh, the vendors, or excuse me, the bidders be both in good standing with the Department of Revenue and Tax and uh, being the highest bidder, et cetera. For um, the second of my recommendations, it's about standardizing that statement about those within the House of Cards being 21. So. In the different versions that have come and gone, there's been confusion with 18, with 21. Um, it looks like there's been work to try to clarify that. But just to make it clear, uh, because before it said that people, in an earlier version, that people working for the House of Cards 
uh, that they only needed to be over 18. So I just want it to be clear that in order to ensure that no person under the age of 21 be allowed to partake in the games of chance uh, and so forth, and persons under the age of 21 um, that, that we add this, and again, I've, I've written some language, but uh, they make sure that none of their employees are under the age of 21 and that nobody under any circumstance are in there. So I just was kind of imagining, I don't know, maybe there's going to be a delivery or something and, and uh, without thinking maybe somebody wouldn't be checking their age because they're just a delivery person. So just trying to clarify, to keep that consistency with the 21, which I was pleased to see that the 21 was instituted for the House of Cards. I think that's important. So in 2.5, I have that for the security protocol. I have language in 5.1, that's where the employee um, language comes in. But again, I can give this to the chair so that they can see the language of having the um, age of 21 be just consistent. They may have been thinking of it, but the language isn't there, so just to make sure that the language is there. And the same for 5.8.1, um, participant and employee restriction on the minimum age. Um, I do also have a recommendation on the times of operation in 5.4. So the mayors themselves initially asked for 6 to 12 uh, 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. And um, the hours have kind of fluctuated. And so I've come up with what I hope is a compromise uh, that will be acceptable and show up in the bill. And again, I can pass this language on to the chair. But from Monday to Thursday, to have the 6 p.m. to 12 a.m., on Friday to have 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. On Saturdays to have 4 p.m. rather than noon to 2 a.m. And Sundays from 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. Um, my other recommendation is, and, and the mirrors are gonna have a lot going on. They're gonna be extremely busy um, and there have been those questions about uh, transparency. And so I think it just would simplify matters for the mayors as well as the others to just have their, um, their paperwork be prepared by an independent accounting firm. That way somebody else is kind of burning the midnight oil to get those things done. And that way it's very easy for you to turn it in to the OPA. So that would be my recommendation. Um, I've recommended it before, but I'd just like to throw it out one last time. To establish a liberation festivities society so that some of this work can be happening throughout the year, I think it'll be good for our community. It's gonna keep these sort of issues present in our mind, caring about the Manamco, having opportunities to hear and think about the struggles and the sacrifices that they went through, I just, I think it would be a good thing. So I'd like to encourage that again, that we have a Liberation Festivities Society, um, keeping it present in our minds, creating those opportunities for us to be reflecting and um, appreciating that sacrifice. And then there's not the pressure that we're ex experiencing right now is to try and kind of rush to get it done because some of that legwork will already be done for us. So, so to this Maasi for everybody, uh, for the mayor's council for having made the, so many of the changes that they have and for those who are testifying for being committed to the community and um, putting forth recommendations that you think will strengthen this. So to this Maasi. I would like to make a comment on the times, if I may. You know, um, I had no problem with the times as they were set out because we have to realize 
that part of the goal is to make this convenient for those so inclined to participate. 3.30, the federal government gets off work. Five o'clock, the employees of government of Guam that work in the Aganya area get off work. And I think, you know, rather than moving it up to six, you know, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be considerate of the vendors that are jumping through the hoops that we have set before them. And I think that the four to two and the 12 to two hours are reasonable because it's more convenient for people during the week who are on their way home if they want to stop because if we move it to six o'clock during the week, then people are going to go home and they might not decide to come down again. I'm trying to be considerate of the vendors a little bit, just a little bit. And uh, I think that the hours that were put there were, were reasonable compromise to the previous hours, which was 24 seven. So um, I just wanted to put, put that out there. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think it's important to hear from both sides at all times. I initially was pushing for six to 10 every night, no exceptions, so we're all compromising here. <laughs> I don't always find myself agreeing with Ken, but I agree with his <laughs> Quick, take a picture, <laughs> compromise. <laughs> and, and Senator, you know, I mean, on weekends, our families, they, they, they want something to do. And by times, Four o'clock, six o'clock comes home, they're tired already. You know, so let them start out maybe from lunch or from brunch, go to the event. And I mean, you see it happen during the other festivals. They start at 10 in the morning and people are there coming and enjoying. So I mean, for two days a week, I, I don't think it's gonna break anybody's back to, to allow it, you know? I mean, and like he said, for the sake of the vendors, they also need to, you know, for all the, the investment and the time they put in it, you've got to give them an opportunity to, to get something back. And, and just, so to be very frank, we've, we've already had bidding open for the outside, the games of skill, for the food. Um, while we've had some bidders, the people that we had bidding before are holding back simply because they want to know really if they're going to be games of chance or not because they've seen what happened in the past two years, where some of them lost their you know what, because there was nothing except Wednesday night, Liberation Day, and the last night that had any people really coming. We've, I've deposited $21,015 from the bids of last Tuesday and Wednesday. That's only 10 people bidding for the games, kitty games, and 10 for the food. Like I said, others are there holding back. And if we're gonna only raise this kind of money, it's not going to, going to work. So giving them that little bit of time more, I don't think it's going to, it's just going to help them. And then allow our people more opportunities to come down and see what's happening at the 75th Carnival. I just want to add also that, you know, I've been mayor for like 12 years and I'm pretty much aware of the time and the time here that that Angel you place here is, you know, the time where people would come down to the carnival and enjoy themselves. So in as far as making an amendment to this time, I, I think you're, you're right on the spot and I give Glenn the uh, uh, thank you very much because I'm beginning to admire you, Glenn, man. Because, uh, I mean, Ken, because uh, this is the first time that uh, I, I, you kind of agree with, with, with uh, the mayors, you know? And thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Go ahead, Senator Tello. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question on, uh, Jackie, your uh, testimony here on uh, number two. Um, actually, I, I'll address this to you, 
Angel, I didn't realize that there was a not, is, is this intended, uh, the maintenance plan, is this intended to be kept by the mayor, it's a $200 deposit and then kept to clean up within 15 days, because it, or is this a deposit and then if you clean it up and do a good job, you get your money back? I was actually gonna bring that up and, and I'm glad you brought it up. Jackie, if we made it non-refundable, you know what's gonna happen? is gonna leave all their trash, all their pallets, all their nails, all their cans, and leave it for the mayor's council to come and take it. Okay. They'd just rather give you, give, take you $200 and we're, we're out of here. We're saying refundable because we want them to come back and take their stuff out so that it doesn't fall again on the staff of the mayor's council of Guam to start cleaning up. Um, we even wanna make it even stricter that the house of the cars be 500, the, the food be 200 and these other kitties only 100 uh, because we've, we've experienced where we charge them and they know they're not getting a refund and they said after the last day bye bye it's all yours you clean it up yourselves mm. and so if we make it refundable at least we give them an incentive to come back and take if not all at least take most of their stuff back you know uh, so that's the only reason why. Thank you, Angel. Um, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Um, I was under the impression that they were putting in the deposit and that the mayor's council was going to be doing the cleaning, but if they're going to be doing the cleaning up, I, I, um, I would take that back. So. Okay, thank you. So, Angel, if I'm not mistaken, shouldn't there something, be something in here that says refundable? refundable. Once yes, we, we have to. Yeah. So you have to incorporate that. There, there needs to be an amendment My, my there. secretary, Mr. Chris, uh, missed ref okay. refundable. Okay, so an amendment needs to be made there to make it refundable, yes, okay? Yes, yes. Um, and you can also increase the, I mean, the amount, the like amount for the house I, of cards to 500, the food to 200, and the other games outside just $100. You know, I would appreciate if you can do that uh, by putting, because you, you guys are the experts. You've been dealing with this for how many years doing yeah. the liberation that we look to you for advice on that. So. Um, the cost on uh, individuals having a booth, like a, um, uh, like the duck duck, you know, the yeah. for kids, kids, kitty toys and stuff like that. Area, how much would you charge them to clean up and et cetera down the line? How much house would, uh, of cards would be to clean up and break down? So let us know what that is um, as like later today, today if you can, yeah. or, right. or the, I'm sorry, uh, to the chairman of, of the committee if you can send it to him, right. so he can incorporate that as an amendment. I would clarify Thank that. Thank you. The other one is, um, you know, I, I appreciate um, you being here too as well, Ken and, and Jackie, uh, for your input on this. Um, I think it's become a, a better um, a bill or uh, rules and regulations actually, and uh, something that we can use maybe next year. And of course, we'll come back next year and tweak it if something seems to be abused in any way or manner, shape or form. Um, but the part that you mentioned about the first gentleman and, and where their 45% goes to, um, I don't mind you putting down something about uh, a nonprofit organization that the first gentleman may uh, decide of his choice of the nonprofit organization to award it to. Um, it's fine, but seriously, on the mayor's side, uh, they work very hard. This is one of the projects they do uh, to generate funding. So um, it's not, and you said it yourself, it's not a slush fund. It's somewhere where they can contribute back to be the mayors that they are to the community. Um, they, they may, uh, the hospital may need something, and the mayors feel proud to be able to say, we did this for the hospital, you know. We did this for cancer care survivors. We did this for, you know, um, the Regalu House or a any other nonprofit. But for us to dictate where they should uh, put this money, I, I, I really don't think that should happen. They work too hard for this. So um, I appreciate you being here and thank you, Angel, for all your hard work. Uh, toward this, and I think this is going to be a, a very nice celebration since it's the 75th, 75th. Let's keep it diamond. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, let's keep it diamond. Okay. Sijus Masi, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, uh, Senator, uh, my favorite. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just have several questions. The, when, when the previous speaker mentioned your 2.6 section and your maintenance plan, um, what happened to Tizen? I remember that last term um, when the carnival was over, the casino that was there was left abandoned. So, so we had to find a way. There was a bill that proffered additional money to the Barragata mayor in thousands of dollars to clean up that mess in Tizen left by the casino. So can you explain how, did that, how that happened? I'm not sure I understand the, the question, Senator. How I was going to ask you, am I making sense? So when the casino closed down, Yes. They left a bunch of things. They left um, lights. They left that tin building. They left trash all around the casino. And this is materials that came from the casino that was in operation. So in, in an effort for one of my colleagues last term, they were trying to push a bill that appropriated thousands of dollars to the Barragata mayor to help clean up the carnival site to include the materials left from the casino uh, to give them that money to help clean up that area. And so I'm just wondering, uh, how did that transpire? What was, the, what was the cleanup cost for the casino that they had to pay a deposit? What was the deposit they paid when they started the casino? Well, at that time, Senator, there was no deposit. Okay. Because okay. the reason why I'm asking this is because the, the bill that we were uh, moving forward with was more than ten thousand dollars. So, if if this section two point six is only for the games of chance vendors, and I wanted to be clear that the games of chance vendors are these items: Beto Beto, color game, or are we just talking about House of Cards? They'll be only in one house. Those games, except for the color game, okay. the big and small, and big the Beto Beto. Yes. Okay. So each vendor for each game we'll have to put a deposit of $200, right? Yes. Okay, so the House of Cards, I was wondering perhaps we can explore the option of increasing the deposit more than $200. Yes. Because yeah. if, if I'm bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars in a casino, I'm not gonna care for $200 to clean up my mess. You're right. So what would be a fair number? I mentioned 500, but if you want to increase it, I agree with that too. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking maybe like 5,000. Because you're giving it back to them. Refundable. Yes. It's refundable, right? So definitely... And then maybe we I'll ask see them to a... donate it to a nonprofit instead of giving it back to them. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> so we won't see the the tin house you that know, they left at uh, Tizen and then yeah. the government has to foot well, the Well, actually, that all belonged to, to the uh, historical society. It no okay. longer belongs to the vendor. So um, historical um, so society is no So they donated everything, yeah. But uh, you brought up a good idea. I mean, if we charge them the $5,000 refundable cleanup fee, maybe I can convince them to give it to our great recycling lady, Peggy Denny. Okay. For all her efforts during the carnival, I mean, I, I, we use what can quote our slush fund last time. We bought her a brand new pickup truck because the poor lady was driving around with a pickup truck that's falling apart in the back, no more tailgate. Her door is being tied by a piece of wire. But and so you see that new truck running around that says, I recycle. That actually came from the Mayor's Council of Guam, portion of the funds. Uh, I don't want to digress, but the funds that the Mayor's College of Guam got, we didn't, we didn't keep it for ourselves. We, we've given close to $200,000 to Regalo yes, to yes. build that house. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's not that Because we it was appropriated it. in the law. Well, that, it, it, it says that first it, it's her choice, but we also gave her, in addition to her share, our, our share. Okay. Well, that was very generous of you, but we're not here to try to raise money for a nonprofit. We're trying to, yes. the idea is you're going to do this for yeah, liberation. But, but you gave me an idea, so I'll, I'll pursue that. Okay. And then um, 
I, rem I remember reading in an article, or perhaps someone was telling me um, that, and forgive me for not coming to your Tuesday meetings, but I do send uh, one of my team members there when, when, we have, when we can afford to, to listen in on the deliberations for the Liberation Day Carnival. And there was discussion about tickets for the rides instead of money. Are we still moving forward with tickets for the rides instead of money? Well, that's what Ken's suggestion was, that just one ticket cage for everything at the carnival. And I'm just saying it, it, it won't work. You go to a ticket cage for the rides, but you, you pay your money, then you get a ticket yeah. to go to the ride. Yeah, I remember that when I was a kid. Yeah. Give money to and buy tickets. So I'm wondering, for this Betsu Betsu color game, big and small, I don't feel very comfortable with having money be exchanged and there's no officer there to to document the money yeah, coming in and out. That's I mean, something that we would have to deal with, but using chips on that, those kind of games will not work either. And I don't think any vendor would even want to bid for that kind of concession. So we're just going to, and that's the thing is you can't track the cash that comes in and out of these small vendors. Well, that's why they have to complete their forms beginning before they open the game and at the end of the game on a daily basis. Okay, so I, I we think should have just, an officer yeah. there. Well, the officers right, will be there and they're going to be coming around and making roaming, sure. But not roaming, but there should be well, an officer if stationed you have, there. I don't, even, I don't know that they have enough officers to, to watch two, four, six, eight, at least eight of those games outside each Oh, so how many, how many games are you planning to have? For, how many booths for Beto Beto are you planning to have? The Rules and Recs is up to two, up That's to four true. color game and up to two. Um, so you're looking to max small. out all of that? I mean, you know, and if we get bidders for all of that, good for us. I mean, we, we raise money. If we don't, then we may not even get any, okay. really. Uh, one, more, one more question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your patience. The, uh, it was mentioned about the concern of the proceeds, 45% going to the Mayor's Council of Guam, 45% to the First Gentleman. Just to clarify, you are saying allow the Mayor's Council to uh, receive the 45%, but further identify where the Mayor's Council will put the money to. Right? You're not, if if you want to do it that way, okay. Yeah, it's uh, because we just want the receiving entity to know that at least this is coming from the share of the mayor's council of Guam. Okay. That we work hard for it so that they can get it. Okay. That's all. And if the mayors do know where these houses are that they're doing gambling mm -hmm. in, I would really, really like to know. And perhaps we can, you know, find a, a, a law that. Uh, or create policy that negates that because if we're turning a blind eye, it seems that that's what it looks like, that we're turning a blind eye that these things exist and we're not doing anything about it. But, but if, if people you can, know, yeah. the, like you said earlier, the mayors are aware of these things going on, then they should, they should alert us yeah. so that we're not turning a blind I, eye. I the think legislature we have, does not want to turn a blind I, eye I, to I, that, I, I think, don't think. I think they have alerted law enforcement, but because of the provision in law that talks about social gambling, it's, mm -hmm. it's very hard. But if we take these same rules and regulations and probably apply it to them, mm -hmm. then we would be making, the government of Guam would be get, making tax revenues yeah, but then from that would them. be a year-round thing. Well, and we don't and want that, Mr. Sablon. We only want 60 days. Because well, gambling but then is a social that's what I'm saying. and an addiction. If we don't do this, it's still happening. So, so we can combat yeah, the, those right. areas with the help of the mayors. Okay. Mr. Madam Mr. Senator, if I can also add to that, um, that's not always the case that we turn a blind eye. Um, in our neighborhood, which is right across the street from Ironwood and Tumon Heights, uh, in fact, one of our neighbors um, found that a bar had turned into a game room. And within days, uh, we brought the, that to the attention of the, of the media. But the mayor had no idea. And when the question was posed to Reverend Tax, who issued the license for this, within hours the game room was closed. So I agree with you. You know, we can we can bring attention to these illegal, not only private situations, but also game rooms that are not really game rooms. They're gambling rooms. Um, and so let's not mince words with what they are. But the public can do something if they are prepared 
to take the effort um, and let people know what's happening in their, in their neighborhood and they're unafraid of whatever potential consequences because this was right across again from the Ironwood um, uh, housing group and every morning there were young children that were going right past that game room um, to the bus stop and we see them every morning around 7 in the morning and to have something like that operate 24 hours a day that should not ever happen so again it can happen you know concerned neighbors need to step up um, we need to bring it to the attention of those that are that make the decisions and we can force a shutdown as we did thank you Ms. Moretti thank you Mr. Chair uh, Senator Mars Seduce Masi, Chair. Um, in trying to be concise and not take up too much time and read through things like verbatim, um, I had actually accidentally skipped over one of the sections because it was embedded in some of the verbiage. So we had talked before, and I still think it's important to have some penalty, some sort of consequence, some incentive to follow the 21 age limit that the mayors have uh, now placed on the House of Cards. And so um, what, what I wrote, but it can be adjusted, but again, seeing the need for some sort of incentive to actually abide by the 21 your age limit that the mayors put in. Uh, for section 2.5 in the security protocol, I added on a sentence or two at the very end. If a person under the age of 21 is found within a house of cards at any time, the house of cards vendor shall in the first instance be issued a $1,000 penalty payable to the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center since they deal with some of these issues uh, um, for our youth within 24 hours of the occurrence. In the second instance, the House of Cards vendor shall be issued a $5,000 penalty payable to GBHWC, the uh, Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center, within 24 hours. In the third instance, the House of Card vendor, and this is following the guidelines that you had uh, for another, uh, for, not, for not reporting properly, so it's already in the rules and regulations, um, but it's applied to a different element. The house cards vendor shall be shut down and no longer able to operate during the Liberation Day Carnival and shall be prohibited from participating in future bids for the next five years. So um, just to encourage, like I said, and provide that incentive, just like you were saying with the trash cleanup, they need incentive perhaps to, to just make sure that the rules that you're putting out are going to be abided by. Some sort of penalty in the first, maybe in the second instance, and then third, perhaps following your, your recommendation in the other section of uh, just go ahead and shutting them down. So I just wanted to put that out there. I had forgotten earlier. Thank you, Senator Mars. Go ahead, uh, Senator Theresa Lai. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just want to clarify. So, Mr. Sablan, on page three of the bill, they list all the games of chance, and it also includes bingo as a game of chance. And then on page four, they list uh, the number of vendors for each type of game of chance, and, um, and then the games requiring skill. And then, and then it lists the minimum bid for each of these, but none of those lists include bingo. Good question. And the only reason why it's, it's that way is because the Mayor's Council Home operates at least 12 small bingos in their senior centers, and we wanted to give them an opportunity first to be the ones to operate this for the liberation so that they can use it back into their senior centers. Then if they cannot, then we will be asking for, for vendors. But Senator, to be very frank with you, with five bingo houses being operated now every night with prizes as much as $100,000, I don't believe that we're gonna have anybody that would want to, to do this at the uh, Liberation Carnival except for 
the village mayors that operate it now in their centers. And that's the only reason why it's not there. So if the village mayors operate the bingo, there will be no, no minimum bid amount. You're saying you're not going to bid those out. You're no, because they, they already have the machines and they have the tables and the chairs. So, yeah. So whatever money they make, they'll just come back to the, and let them decide, the 12 centers decide how they, through their senior um, council, how to divvy out that money. Hopefully, like I said, we'll get uh, them to operate it. If not, then um, I don't see any house of bingos out there wanting to come down there and operate when they already are operating out in the community. But at the last carnivals, were there, weren't there houses, bingo houses also? They didn't have bingo at the last okay. carnival. Not the no. last one, but before that? In Not even the two years, okay. no. And the, the year before that, uh, we actually used, remember the, the, that building that's there now? Yes. Uh, because it wasn't used for the, for the casino, it was actually mm -hmm. used for the bingo. And even that, uh, they did not, the Sinahani Mayor's office operated it, and okay. but I think they just broke even. All right, and then, so I see the minimum bids here. So for example, House of Cards minimum bid is $250,000 and you're allowing two. So with that alone, hopefully we're gonna be able to cover the cost. Hopefully. But my understanding, I mean, you're, you, I know you're making it sound like, oh, we're very late, we might not get enough bids, but my understanding is that in reality, the mayors, they receive bids much higher than these amounts. Yes, but those are, remember events that, uh, were scheduled way, we already have bids done since February when we had it at $800,000. The time frame was different, it was 24 seven. And so those kind of things are the ones that are gonna affect how much actually are gonna come. Even the fact that there's a law allowed for two may discourage one or the other to go come in because they're gonna say, well, I may not make money because the other one, but we put it in there because we, we did not want a monopoly. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Charlai. Angel, I just want to kind of just raise uh, one thing, and, and you know, because I'm hearing that there's not that uh, many of an enthusiasm from the vendors to, uh, because it's kind of late, to uh, go on for the bidding on the activities at the carnival. What happens if you come out with a deficit? And I'm pretty sure you're not going to come out with a de deficit, but just in case. What are you going to do? Well, we should know, and I don't know how soon this process will, will be completed, but <clears throat> we really won't know how much money we're going to have to expend for the carnival itself. I mean, the queens, they would know, because when they count their money and decide who's queen, they already know how much money they have there for the raffle and the queen. But for, as far as for the carnival and the parade, which are combined together as far as funds, we really would not know until we bring in the, the concession fees. And uh, so far, like I said, I've only deposited a little bit over $20,000 from what's already been bid for. Uh, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before, we, uh, we, before I conclude this, uh, this uh, uh, conference here, uh, not conference, but the testimonies and all that, things that we need to absorb, and as far as recommendation is concerned, I just want to add that uh, if you do have a, a written testimony, you can send it to my address at Bridge Point, Building Suite 202, 140 Espinal Avenue, Hagania. And if you want to send it to my uh, email, send it to Senator Peter at Senator J. P. Terlai, not J. T. Terlai, <laughs> dot com. Okay, thank you very much. You have 10 days to submit your written testimony. And the time now is uh, 3.55 maybe, 3.55. Thank you. The public hearing is now adjourned. Thank you very much.